Hello, Space Watchers, and welcome back to a new episode of Space Cafe Radio. I'm Emma Gatti, contributing editor at Space Watch Global, and today we are going to go to explore a typical Martian home. This is the third episode of our coverage of the Amadi 20 mission, which started on the 4th of October. Amadi 20 is a Mars analog simulation based in the Negev Desert in Israel. The mission is managed by the Austrian Space Forum and is hosted by the Israeli Space Agency. Our guest today is uh, Alon Shika, architect, lecturer at the seminar Kibbutzim, co-founder of DMARS, architect of the Amadi 20 mission base Amdat site, and last but not least, high school champion for high jumping. Cool. Alon, Great. welcome to Space Cafe Radio welcome. and thank you for joining us today. Hmm. How are you? Nice to be here uh, with you. I'm doing well. I just came back from my studio, working a little bit and ready for uh, the weekend. To rock and roll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Alon, I own a very old VW bus from the 80s and I know from experience that the smaller the living space, the better it has to be engineered. So I want to know everything about this station. And let's start with the most obvious question. How big is the Amadi 20 Mars station? It's like a, a small family house in the city. When I was a kid, I used to stay a lot in a, my parents' bathroom. And it was such a small uh, place. And constantly I, I reimagined or reshaped it with different elements, different functions. And I think that's why I thought I need to be an architect. And doing space missions, doing space architecture, it takes this notion, this idea of mixing things together to the next level and to the extreme. The, the Amadi Bay station, it's our second prototype of our habitat. And the first one was a, only 15 square meters that can be open until around 50 square meters. Everything was condensed in that small space, uh, including, of course, a very interesting uh, lab, a uh, control area, uh, and of course, a personal space for the astronauts, a uh, kitchen place for them to sit together and to uh, and also enjoy their experiment. The second stage uh, that we built for the Amadi mission, we tried to separate a bit between, let's say, work and free time, recreation time. The new habitat, the new model is 60 square meters and it uh, contains a clean lab, uh, also a control area and a large area for the astronauts to wear uh, their suits. In a way, uh, it's quite an uh, interesting program. It's quite uh, interesting functions that not naturally live together. And uh, my technique for the astronauts to feel comfortable with the functions, they try as much as possible to make different passage that could connect the different program, the different functions in the habitat. So uh, we have uh, six, 60 square meter. Mm -hmm. May I ask you how much it costs? It's a difficult question. Um, I just all, want to know if you are in the market range. No, of course. <laughs> it's really fun. It's a good question. First of all, I have to say that the Israeli Space Agency helped us a lot. Uh, and of course, uh, financially, they are the main sponsor of the project. But this really costs relatively nothing. I think for the, the 60 square, the new habitat and the old habitat together cost us around 120,000 euros, something like that, around $150,000. We did a lot with ourselves. Maybe I, will, I could talk about a little bit about Demos because it's an initiative, it's a non-profit organization that takes all the space, Mars, cool geeks and put them together. And we are a band of, of space uh, enthusiastic and it's mostly about human mission to space. Let's also say, I just want to clarify, 120,000 uh, euros within the space business. It's a small number that is correct. We, I just want to give a concept to this number because maybe people heard this and you say, oh my God, this is a lot. But it's a, within the space business is actually a small number. Uh, so I totally agree with you because all of the habitat inside is consist of different sensors and, and top-notch equipment and, and of course electricity and, and water. Exactly. Uh, I want to get into this. The crew has to live inside the space for a long time. They need to survive. How about food? We have a lot of basics. This is what is interesting about building habitats and and before I answer, we need to clarify the, the notion of the idea of a habitat. It's a phrase for ecology. It means the overall conditions or everything that a, an organism needs in order to not only to survive, but also to flourish, to create a community, let's say. And because of that, we really need to 
hacker, we really need to understand all the ingredients in a way that human need in space, that human need also on Earth. So combining all these units together, you, you get with the famous architect once said that the house is, is just like a machine. So habitat is like a machine on steroids. It's really, everything is really intense. I suppose they must be self-sufficient. Of course. So everything needs to know how to live by its own. For example, the electricity. We have a large sonar that gave us electricity, the energy. All the water consumption, all the water waste, we are recycling, we are using it multiple times. Also for the toilets, for example, but also to grow plants, for the astronauts to eat those plants. Everything needs to be calculated. Everything needs to be under a budget. If I go back to the food, of course, we made a lot of calculations. We are designing this mission for almost three years. We, we really understand the budget, the amount of food and water that each astronaut needs. And we design everything from this budget. The amount, of course, of storage place, the amount of how much things we want to grow. Everything needs to be stored a very smart way in a very, let's say, the, compact. Uh, comp the minimum place that it needs to occupy. So what do they eat? Mostly they eat powders that you mix them with water. At the beginning, we gave them some vegetables and, and, and fruits, but because it's a long duration mission, three weeks, so the fruits are cutting down and you, you need to, to rely more and more on powders. And also because when you send something to space, it will take the minimum volume. Uh, of course, powders of course. Are, are a very good solution in that sense. So hot water and powders. And a bit of a technical question. I was wondering if the pressure inside is one Earth atmosphere or is it pressurized at lower pressure like an airplane, for example? And I just give a bit of context to this just to remind everyone Mars atmospheric pressure is less than 1% of Earth pressure. So we will need, in case we go on Mars, to pressurize both the habitats and the suits. So I was wondering how it's working. It's very difficult on Earth to create, to mimic the exact conditions in space. We do it, for example, in the International Space Station, we build entire stations under the water. This could somehow mimic the different atmospheres and pressure. But because we are doing prototypes and because this is our second prototype, the budget is killing us. So we couldn't really mimic the exact differences. But we know this is a big challenge in architecture point of view. And we did create the airlock. So the airlock for the listening to us is the vaster, it's the area that you somehow level the pressures between inside and outside. We build it, we have a unit that push air inside of it. So this gives you the feeling that we are lowering the pressure, we are making it high. We, we are taking time of delay of how much time it takes to reduce the pressure. We are trying to understand all of these conditions, but without really doing the exact pressuring differences. Of course. This is also why we're doing a project like Amedi 20, just to try and understand what's the best architecture. Mm -hmm. For sure. A lot of people say, okay, what is the value? Because you are not really mimicking all the conditions. But when answering these kind of questions, I always like to, to give the example of water vehicles, space vehicles, or, or planes, for example. How much time humanity uh, took to develop uh, submarines or to develop airplanes? It takes us many years. And of course, now we are in a much more technological advantage period. But still, we really need to build it. We really need to learn from one another. We really need to learn from this kind of experiment. For my behalf, it doesn't really matter that I'm not mimicking all the conditions, but that once I you know just a normal experiment that you are trying to close the amount of values that you want to check or you want to understand. And, and for me, we are getting better in each mission. Let me ask you another technical question. The air composition inside the station is earth composition, but you also think about way how to produce oxygen and nitrogen in the future. Of course, because just now we have solar energy solution. We have a water waste solution, and we have a lot of sensors that try to understand the movement of the astronauts inside and outside the habitat. We are covering the astronauts with biometrical solution. We are trying to analyze and try to suggest solution for this field of study. For us, it will be an honor in our next stations to really understand how we can produce oxygen, how we can really control the budget of the oxygen that habit, this habitat will, will need. The entire habitat is closed just like a submarine. No air is coming from the outside unless we put it in with our system. But, but still, I think we need a little bit more, I think maybe in, the, in, in our fifth prototype, 
we will start to really control the quality of the air. Fantastic. What was the hardest part of building uh, the Mars Raymond station? Because I'm an architect and I'm doing a large scale project. So for me to build a 100 square meters project, it's quite small. But as I told you, it's a project on steroids. So it's quite small, but I can compare it to a thousand meters uh, project. And I know the procedure of, and I know what is the, the natural float of this kind of project. Everyone around me was completely stressed out, but in a way I knew what we need to come uh, to, which challenges we we will need to confront. I think lacking all of the project, I think the budget was a crucial aspect of it because no matter how much we are creative and no matter how much we know how to find the good solutions, the easy solutions, still budget is a critical element. And I think this was for us the, the most challenging aspect. I think also to build it was challengeable because it was we build it, although we build it in factory with a very interesting concept that we developed in Dimas, that like the spacecraft itself lands like a rigid structure and it has some kind of mechanism that can be deployed. So we build it in the factory, we, we got it landed in the desert, and once you are in the desert, you don't have anything around you, so you are really alone. And you don't have energy, you don't have, sometimes you don't have uh, even communication. But uh, in the sense of materials, in the sense of uh, if something got lost, if something got broken, it's really difficult to find a solution quick. And, and I think also for me, the, the, the Austrian space probe came in the last two weeks before the mission. We, of course, we've been there together. I, I told him that I'm proud that we are coming across this kind of problems because we, now we understand how difficult or really difficult it is to build something uh, 200 million kilometers on average uh, like Mars. It's really a, a difficult challenge and I think the distance is a crucial element. The challenges are incredible, but I can see in the passion of your words and also in the evolution of your story, I almost see the evolution of human history. This is fantastic. The entire concept of building a house in space or on another planet is incredible. And I think we all should feel excited of actually being part of this. Then I thank you so much, Alon, for opening us the okay. doors of the DMAR Summit Space Station. Uh, this is unfortunately the end of our third episode, but we will be back. For the sure. next episode will be try to do a sum up of the mission and what will they learn from this month of isolation and how far we are from an actual Mars human mission. Hope Alon, not. thank you so much you. for your precious time. I hope not either. No. And I am really looking forward to hearing from Dimas again because what you do is incredibly interesting. Thank you very much. This is all from Space Cafe Radio and till next time. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Ciao. Bye.